Good morning. Welcome to our worship service at Forest Lake United Methodist. We're so glad that you're with us today. And even in the midst of this, we have a lot to celebrate. Uh, you are still showing yourself so strong as a church, so allow me to share some things. First, our University Place Elementary School book ministry is off to a great start. Because of your generosity, you've given enough to sponsor 65 children. Now, of course, the church is going to make sure that every child gets a book, a new book, every month throughout the school year. But you've already, by your personal donations, provided for 65 children. Thank you for the way you love our kids. You're making a difference in their lives. I also wanted to share with you that due to your generosity and the work of some of our own church folks, uh, we are providing 500 face masks for University Place Elementary School and for Woodland Forest. Your generosity and your work is making sure that our kids will be safer when they go back to, when they go back to campus. So again, thank you so much for helping out with that. Again, we're glad that you're here today. And now let's worship together. Come, let us celebrate the forgiving, reconciling love of God. For once we were lost and felt so far away, now we have been found and welcomed home. Know that God's love is lavished upon you forever. We rejoice at the news of forgiveness and hope. Come, let us celebrate and praise the God of love. Amen. Spirit of life, 
creator of all that is and all that is to come, who surrounds us and fills us, who speaks the word of life in us, and so we listen. We listen to Jesus, revealer of God, our brother and teacher, who lived in prayer and in love. Listening to God's voice and doing God's will, he gave his life in love. But God raised him to life that is eternal, and so we follow him. We follow in the power of the Holy Spirit, God alive in us, for the sake of the healing of the world. We trust in the power of forgiveness, the reality of resurrection, the gift of the universal church as the body of Christ, and the mystery of eternal life. Amen. over a period of about 10 weeks to work with three of our scouts and our scouts BSA program to help them earn the God in Church Award. It's an award that teaches them about what it's like to be a, a, a fully participating member in the church, what it's like to be a part of the ministry that we do. Uh, today we get to award God in the church to these scouts and to congratulate them for hard work. But let me tell you what they did. Among other things, in addition to their weekly lessons, uh, they each read the entire Gospel of John, and we discussed it together. They, uh, they each participated in a mission project that served our homebound people here at the church. And they each participated in designing and putting on a worship service. They did it by video. You perhaps saw them helping to lead worship a few weeks ago. They've done an excellent job. They've shown great maturity, and they're truly deserving of the award that they'll get. Today, I'll give each one of them a medal that can be worn on their uniform for dress occasions. They'll also receive a pack of square knot that can be added to their uniform to show the work that they've done. I'm also gonna be giving each one of you a, uh, a pen to give to your mentor. These scouts didn't go through this journey alone or just with me. They each had a family mentor who walked with them each step of the way, hopefully growing closer together as they did so. So we're gonna honor those mentors by giving them a pen as well. Uh, again, these scouts have worked hard and, uh, and I am so happy to be able to honor them in this way. Uh, first, I'll ask for Emma Kennedy to come down. Emma, congratulations for your hard work. Here's your medal, your square knot a mentor pen for your mentor. You, you work hard in this, just keep it up. The stuff that you learn, keep applying to your life and it's gonna serve you well, okay? All right, thank you, Emma. <laughs> Next, we'll invite Olivia Thomas to come up. Olivia had to do this award with her dad for a counselor, so that's a little extra, I guess. Olivia, your award and your square knot, counselor pen. Olivia, I'm proud of the way you threw yourself into this. You did the work. It's important work, and I hope it gives shape to the, to the way you live the rest of your life. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. And Emma Williams. Every you're doing a good job. Here's your medal and your knot. Here is a mentor pin. Again, the way you threw yourself into this work, I was impressed with it. Uh, and I believe God's working in all of you. Just keep following and it's gonna serve you well. Thank you. The religious emblem, uh, religious emblem program in scouting, excuse me, uh, offers actually four awards, two while they're Cub Scouts and two during Scouts BSA. 
God in Church is a middle school award, and that's what these three girls have, uh, have accomplished today. There's a high school that's available as well, and I hope girls you'll pursue that when you get into high school age. I'm so impressed with our scouting ministry here in the church. I want to encourage you, anytime you get the chance, to do all that you can to support what our scouts are doing. At this time, we want to take a moment just to thank you so much for your ongoing generosity as you continue to be the body of Christ in the world around us through your prayers, presence, gifts, and service. It's a great time during our service to, to recognize that generosity because we just saw three of our own church family members uh, who have done just that uh, during the course of this project and I'm sure in the community as well during this uh, this odd time um, where many feel so isolated. Uh, thank you, all of you scouts, for, for working so hard on that project and fulfilling the value made at your confirmation to support uh, Forest Lake United Methodist Church, the church in general, and, uh, the, and the body of Christ and the world around us through your prayers, presence, gift, and service. Thanks, y'all. Um, if you would like to continue or begin, to support the mission of Forest Lake United Methodist Church uh, through financial means. You can do that uh, via our on online giving link uh, or via the mail. Uh, you can find our address and that link in the description of this video. Let us pray. Gracious God, who created us not simply for a life of servitude to sin and death, but a God who raises us up out of grace and redemption. We cry out to you today, asking for that grace to be showered down on us. Give us grace to accept your forgiveness for us, Give us grace that we might forgive ourselves and give us the grace that it takes to truly forgive those in our lives who have wronged us and others that we love. God, we are good at lip service when it comes to grace and forgiveness. We are good at acknowledging that it is something that we should and must do. But today we come to you and acknowledge that grace is hard, that forgiveness is hard. And so we pray for your strength in this mission of grace. We pray for your courage and boldness. And now we pray that that boldness would continue as we with the very boldness of the saints pray as your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We'd like to now share in a virtual passing of the peace. Uh, those that are present with us in the congregation will have the opportunity to offer words of grace and peace to you at home. Hey, uh, miss, uh, miss all of you guys. Uh, can't wait to get back in church soon, but not too soon. Um, have a blessed day, amen. At this time, we invite you once again, as you're able to join with us in a responsive reading for the Psalter reading for the week which comes from Psalm 103, verses 1 through 18. <laughs> God's holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all God's benefits. 
who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. <laughs> vindication and justice for all who are oppressed, has made known God's ways to Moses, God's acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord will not always chide nor harbor anger forever. The Lord does not, the Lord does not deal with us according to our sins nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is the Lord's steadfast love toward the faithful. As far as the east is from the west, so does the Lord remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion for his children, so the Lord shows compassion for the faithful. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for mortals, their days are like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, upon the faithful and the righteousness of the Lord to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. <laughs>
Our scripture reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18. We'll read verses 21 through 35. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all of his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. Out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father, speak to us on this difficult topic. Lord, give us your wisdom and your power. Lord, to be in relationship with you is to forgive, but it is so far from our natural state. So Lord, help us. Lord, I ask the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. My earliest faith development was in one of the most unhealthy churches you could imagine. Uh, my home church liked to argue. It didn't matter about what. They just liked it. It's in our DNA. We fought. Uh, I remember uh, we had lights out in front of the church building that shone up on the steeple at night so that people that passed by on the busy highway would see the, the very witness of the steeple on our church. Well, part of the church thought we shouldn't run the lights because it cost too much money. Others thought we ought to turn the lights on to, to, to light up the steeple at night. And so they fought about it. There were meetings about it. The board got together and they argued and fought. And then after the decision was made, they fought about the decision. It was every week, it seemed like. It wasn't just the lights outside. Our sanctuary had a dimmer switch for the house lights. Uh, and during the early part of the service, uh, right up until the sermon, the house lights were always all the way up. But when it came sermon time, uh, part of the church thought that the house lights ought to be dimmed during the sermon. Uh, the other part of the church, you guessed it, thought that the house lights ought to still be all the way up. And yes, we thought about it. I was in there. We chose up sides, and each side thought the other was completely wrong. There were meetings about it and discussions and decisions and fights about the decisions. It was silly. Uh, back in those days, we were still using the older United Methodist hymnal, where almost all the hymns ended with the word Amen. You sing all the verses of the hymn, and then after the final verse, everybody would sing Amen. Well, you can see where this is going already. Part of the congregation thought that in real worship, we ought to sing Amen at the end of the hymn. Another part of the congregation thought that we didn't need to do that. And yes, they thought about it, had meetings, decisions, thought about decisions. You see the cycle. My church loved arguing. Uh, it didn't really matter a whole lot what we were arguing. Uh, we weren't happy unless we were mad at each other, it seems. Uh, that's the culture in which my faith was born. And I remember that, and I remember the fellow that I held responsible for it. Uh, back in the day, we called him the ringtail leader of all of it. We uh, thought that he was the source of all the problems in our church. Um, to me, uh, as a junior hire, I thought that he was dousing the flame of the Holy Spirit in my life and in our youth group's life. Uh, he was the embodiment of evil. 
I'm kind of embarrassed to share that with you, but understand this is my 14 year old self. Uh, I, I hope I've grown some since then, but back then I thought this one fellow was the embodiment of evil. And he did do some things that I still think were, were pretty bad. When our new pastor arrived, the, the pastor that I dearly loved, the pastor under whom I was called into ministry, uh, who I held great respect for. When that pastor came, uh, this uh, ringtail leader uh, was the chair of the SBRC committee, our, our personnel committee. And he had a meeting with a new pastor and this SBRC chair said to the new pastor, preacher, this is my church. And pastors that do what I say get to stay. And pastors that don't have to leave. So my pastor replied to him, well, that's not the way I work. God called me here and we'll just have to see about that. Then the SBRC chair said back to him, well, then I'm gonna make your life miserable. And when I finish with you, I'm going to start on your wife and your kids. It's a promise he lived up to. He did make life tough on the pastor. The pastor's son, who was in college by that time, uh, cut the grass for the church. He did an excellent job, in my biased opinion. But he was the guy that did our lawn maintenance at the church. But this, this leader in the church uh, was constantly complaining, constantly trying to get the pastor's son fired from cutting the grass because he's trying to get rid of the pastor. He rounded up a whole opposition against him. They had secret meetings with the district superintendent. Uh, There's just a lot of unhealthy stuff going on and I was very angry about it. Um, I wouldn't have admitted it then because I knew I was right. But looking back on it, I actually hated the man. Again, I hate to admit that. I know better. I, will, I knew better then, but I was so angry that it, that it turned into hatred. So much so that I remember one Sunday, he, he rarely came to church. Uh, he was the chair of the SPRC, but he rarely came to church. Uh, one Sunday he did come. Uh, at the end of the service, during the invitation, he came down to the altar to pray. It should have been a good thing. I should have been hopeful that something good was about to come out of this. But I sat there so blinded by my own grudge that I was mad at him. Like he didn't deserve to be there. I was mad at him for being at the altar because how bad he'd been. He was probably just trying to do it for show. You, you see what a grudge, what unforgiveness, what hatred can do to you. And the thing is, I thought I was justified. As bad as his behavior, I thought that my disdain for him was righteous anger. I thought I had every right to feel that way. I thought he deserved for me to feel that way about him. It was decades later before this parable from today finally took root in my life. It was decades later before I read that parable and I realized how much like the first servant I really was. You remember that first servant? Uh, he owed the uh, he owed his lord, his master, he owed him 10,000 talents. Now in today's terms, that would be roughly or in excess actually of 70 million days wages 70 million days wages he'd never be able to pay it there wasn't that much money in all of history and yet jesus says this servant owed the master ten thousand talents and still the master forgave he pled for mercy and the master forgave uh, finally i began to see that i was a whole lot like that first servant uh, god had forgiven me of that much and so much more. God and God's goodness, not because, not because I earned it, but because of God's incredible love for me. God forgave. So just like that first servant, I was forgiven of an enormous debt. But just like that first servant, I was also trying to hold a puny little debt, 100 days wages. I was trying to hold a puny little debt against my fellow church member. In my 14-year-old arrogance, I held a grudge against a fellow church member because I was convinced he was wrong and, and he deserved it. I was blind to the plank in my own eye while I was pointing out the speck in my fellow church member's eye. Worse yet, I thought my anger was righteous. I was hating him in the name of Jesus. Lord help me. I was 
I was drinking my own poison and waiting for him to die. That's what unforgiveness does to us. But finally, decades later, I, with, with a lot of help from God and some good other friends and Christian leaders, finally began to come to my senses and I, I realized that I've got to obey Jesus. I've got to listen to what Jesus says in this parable, even if I don't like it, even if it's uncomfortable. I had to wrestle with the issue of forgiveness. Now, this fellow really had hurt me. It hurt some other people. And I still believe that some of what he did was wrong. But when Christians are wrong, we forget. That's what Christ calls us to do. When we are wrong, we forget. It sets the other person free. It also sets us free. It's the path to our healing. When Christians are wrong, we forget. Now, let me be real careful here. Forgiving someone doesn't mean that you have to expose yourself to uh, to danger by being around them again. If someone is a toxic person, it's okay to forgive them and keep your distance. Forgiving someone also doesn't mean that you don't seek justice. If someone commits a crime against you, you can forgive them for the crime, but still let the justice system do what they have to do to protect the rest of the community. But forgiveness is the way of Christ. We are forgiven in the way we forgive. Now, we've all been hurt, especially during these contentious times, these times of, of horrible division in our country. It seems like people are more angry at one another than I can remember. And so there's a lot of hurting going on. That means the need for a lot of forgiveness. And the deeper the hurt, the harder the work of forgiveness. But first, what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not just pretending nothing happened. And some people mistake those two. They think, well, I'll just pretend like nothing ever happened. But that's not really forgiveness. And forgiveness, we've got to own up to the fact that something wrong did go on. We've got to be honest. I was leading a retreat years ago. And uh, during a prayer time, a middle-aged woman came to me and she was in great distress. And she wanted to share with me. She was, she was feeling some real emotional pain. As we talked, she began to reveal to me that as a child, she had been abused by her grandfather twice. And we began talking about what it would be like to, to begin to heal from that kind of emotional pain. Somebody she trusted so much that betrayed that trust so deeply. We began to talk about that kind of healing. Uh, and she said something that just really stuck with me. When we were talking about the pain that she endured, she said, well, it only happened twice. And it just it floored me in that moment. It only happened twice, that denial. It really wasn't a big deal. I should just get over it. That's not forgiveness. In fact, that kind of denial blocks forgiveness. As long as we pretend nothing happened, then we really don't have the ability to forgive. Also, genuine forgiveness is usually more than what we learned on the kindergarten playground. You remember how that works out. Two children tied up, they get angry with one another on the playground. The teacher separates them and tells them to apologize to each other. And they begrudgingly offer a few words of apology. Well, I'm sorry. And then the teacher turns to the other and says, what do you, what do you say to him? Well, it's okay, or I forgive you. Well, they're not really sorry and they probably hadn't really forgiven. They're still angry at one another. But we have, make forgiveness out to be this little kindergarten playground exchange when so often it's far more. Again, the deeper the hurt, the tougher the road to forgiveness. One of my professors in seminary actually lines out seven steps of forgiveness. I've listed those on our Facebook devotion for this week. I encourage you to check it out. But more than that, I'd encourage you to, to have the courage to pursue it. You see, if you've been hurt, when we've been hurt, forgiveness leads to freedom. Unforgiveness leads to imprisonment. That's the result of the parable. You forgive, you're set free. Lack of forgiveness, you're held in bondage, in prison, in torture. If you've been hurt, I pray that you'll have the courage to begin the difficult journey of forgiveness. But you don't have to do it alone. In fact, I would encourage you to have a spiritual friend to walk through the journey with you. 
If I can help, I would love to do that. If I can, if I can walk through you, walk with you through that process of forgiveness, I would be honored to do so. If, you, if you'd like to reach out and talk about it, uh, my email address is on the screen right now. You can email me anytime and we can have a confidential conversation that hopefully will lead you towards forgiveness and towards an emotional healing. Forgiveness is tough. It's one of the toughest things Christ asked Christians to do. But it's in forgiveness that we find true joy and true peace. I invite you to join me on that difficult journey towards peace. Amen. <laughs>